Hey everybody, Isaac here, and welcome to the fifth episode of Between Two Cats, the podcast where we take a peek behind the curtain of the biggest names in the quantum programming community. In this episode, I got to speak with Maria Schuld. Now, if you don't know who Maria is, she's a researcher here at Xanadu, and I would consider her to be one of the founding members, if not the founding member of quantum machine learning as we know it, while also being a founding member of Penny Lane. Maria spent most of her university days as a student in Germany, but did her PhD in South Africa, where she's originally from, in quantum machine learning. Maria is responsible for a lot of work in this field. I'll put her Google Scholar link in the description if you want to check out some of her papers. Maria is also at the front of kind of thinking about what we should be doing with quantum machine learning, kind of from like a philosophical level, I guess. I'll put some links in the description to some of her recent blog posts, QHack talks, and other things. Definitely go check that out. Maria's got quite a bit to say, and it's really, really interesting. We covered a ton in this interview, so I really do hope you enjoy it. Subscribe to the channel if you want to know when more of these episodes drop. Give this video a like if you liked it. And without further ado, here is Maria Schuld. Maria, thanks for joining me. Really yeah. appreciate, you know, I, I, I know you're like super busy. Um, so I really appreciate your time. I do. Thanks I do. for having me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, how, how are you doing today? It's like fall time in Toronto. I don't know if you miss the fall in Toronto or like in Canada. Like I miss the fall in general, yeah. Yeah. It's when the leaves are a bit brown, everyone's a bit like quiet. Yeah. Yeah. To be here that time. yeah. So um, yeah, it's your first time back in Toronto in a while. So like, what's the thing you miss the most, and I guess miss the least about about Toronto? <laughs> it's not perfect. <laughs> What I miss the most is very easy. It's the food. Oh my gosh, I love Asian food. In South Africa and Durban, we only have Indian food and it's very hard to get anything else. So every night I try to go to a different restaurant and just like binge eat and uh, oh man, that's a great one. Yeah, I uh, have to agree a little bit there. Um, I That's probably my favorite thing. Um, I'm from out of town, so like in a pretty small town. And uh, you know, we have like the usual like the, the usual uh, suspects like pizza and Thai and stuff like that, but the you know Toronto is obviously very multicultural, so you can just get anything, and it everything's also just at the touch of your fingers with an app. So it's it. Whenever I come here and I have to get lunch, it's like option paralysis, and I just don't know. It's just it's too much. But that's definitely one thing I miss about here. Definitely the the if I could choose one cuisine that I don't get at home, but I come here for, um, is just. Thanks. No. Dumplings? Oh, yeah. oh no, there. Mm. That's true. Actually, yeah. there's one good dumpling place here. It's a it's a franchise. I'll take it from you then. Yeah, later. <laughs> I, I can't remember what the name is. I was gonna say Korean barbecue or Indian food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, Indian food's a hit or miss where where I'm where I'm at. Here, there's like legit places that are like really really good. And when you ask for spicy, they actually give you like true spicy, not like the tamed down North American spicy. I know, however, that's the one food we've got in Durban. Oh, there's a Durban Indian mixture that's also grown over the years by itself. And um, yeah. you know, Gandhi was in Durban. That's the area where he had to spend a lot of his young adult time. So okay. Even the train scene that's so famous like happened there. And oh, okay, so, okay. So it's like a big Indian community and that's amazing, but it's, um, yeah. And the, the more traditional food is just meat, 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 meat. <laughs> if you have a barbecue, it's like two tons of meat. No salad. If you're lucky, a bit of bread, <laughs> maybe a bit of butter. So yeah, it's also nice to have a variety. I need my greens, that's for sure. I can just live on meat and bread. You're here for the research retreat, and I've talked to a couple, to a couple other people here. Um, some of them, it's their first time in Canada, uh, and uh, they you know wanted to experience some you know form of Canadian culture and like that's <laughs> one of one of the things that's inarguably very Canadian is hockey. Yeah. Um, so have you ever been to a hockey game or anything? Uh, so I have been in Cologne once and it was the best sports event I've ever witnessed. It was like engaging, interesting, super exciting. I've never in my life watched hockey before. I didn't even know the rules. I yeah. also always struggled to find where the puck is. Yep. That's the ball. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I missed actually some of the um, some of the colleagues here went on Sunday and I missed the game for various reasons. Um, yeah, so unfortunately not. I find that the best way to um, explore Canadian culture is to go to the public swimming pool. I've done that one year, and it was basically just because I missed the ocean because I'm surfing and swimming a lot, and then um, I need water. I don't know. I was here for a long time, so I thought, okay, I need to go to a, a swimming pool. That's the way like, that I would do it. They went to a public swimming pool and they had aqua fitness. That was the only possibility to actually join or get into the water. Mm. And it was the most interesting people. It was like 
a couple of physics professors from MIT in their like 80s and like very, very different people from what you see in the shiny office areas in Canada. And I thought like, this was amazing. <laughs> I will have to, add, uh, yeah, like if I have any people that come visit me who haven't been here before, uh, I'll have to maybe tell them that. It's interesting. I warn you, the aqua yeah. fitness is really hard. So the, the possibility of drowning is higher than oh. I thought. You have to do funny things that I'm not entirely sure how they should work. But uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. I, I'm a Canadian and I've never thought of that as something as being very... What's desperation in that case? <laughs> <laughs> true, true. People, people say this to you a lot. And like, if, if people were to say this to me a lot, you know, I'd be a little bit like, yes, I take it very humbly, blah, blah, blah. But you are one of the field's like prolific kind of people. Um, you're, you know, when people say Maria Schultz, you know, a lot of people understand what, what's going on. Um, how does that feel? Like, <laughs> like, you know, you're not like Brad Pitt famous, but you know, like, yeah, like, I mean, when you when you go to a conference, I'm sure that, you know, there's, you know, people going like, oh, my gosh, that's Maria Schold. You know, like, yeah. to me, I don't really, if I were to see Brad Pitt, I'd be like, oh, it's Brad Pitt. Hey, Brad Pitt. You know, and I, like, <laughs> and I'm not like downplaying your accomplishments or anything. But, you know, to me, you're just Maria Schold and I we work at the same company and it's all good. So, but yeah, like, how does it how does it feel to kind of have that title behind you? And then like, I don't know, is does it? Does it have any weight on your shoulders or anything or? So very obviously, so all my friends are non-scientists. Most of my friends, not all my friends. Oh my gosh, all, 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 you know, <laughs> yes. are my friends. Um, and they obviously would never know. They wouldn't even care kind of if one scientist is yeah. more important than the other one. If I told them, I don't know, one of, some of my science crushes, like they wouldn't know them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. The other day I was, so we're really, we're sunk in that, that Actually, some people have read what I actually wrote over the years mm -hmm. was when I went to a really cool African machine learning conference that I'm involved in as a volunteer as well. And it's like 800 people, completely classical. I'm a bit the odd person out. I never like talk about quantum in this context just to not confuse people. And all of a sudden, there were like two or three people on the corridor who were like, I know you. You've written a book that I read or like whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I thought like, oh, this is so <laughs> sweet. Um, so the... Um, the good feeling it gives, also I don't really care, but on one level it gives me a huge advantage, which is freedom. So I'm not um, worried about building a career out of other reasons as well. I never wanted to be a physicist, so kind of, yeah, maybe this, this also gives me a bit of freedom. But also kind of, if I go to a conference, I don't have to fight for recognition. There's a lot of mechanisms <laughs> that I don't have to do. And, and that freedom I, I cherish a lot and also... For example, in the last years, I haven't published much because I had many other objectives to fulfill. And if I had to worry about my standing in a community, I would have to have a different strategy and I couldn't do a lot of cool things that I did. So that's, I'm pretty grateful for it. I think it's complete coincidence that this happened though. Yeah. Coincidence, a bit of hard work, but also a lot sure, of- Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, well, I appreciate your humble response. That was, that was <laughs> I, no, that was, that was good. Awesome. G great to hear that. Um, okay, so uh, you mentioned not publishing much in the last couple of years. Uh, well, you had you mentioned some other objectives. One of those things was being a mother, <laughs> so <laughs> quite a big objective. Um, I, I guess like if I were, you know, I, my life is not as busy as yours. Child out of the equation for a second. My life is not as busy as yours. It's just not. Um, if I were to inject a child into my life, it would be, I don't know how I'd manage. I really don't. I mean, that's just partly everybody's life is different, you know, yeah. but like, yeah. How, how do you, how do you manage it all? Like what are the things you do to like, make sure that your head's on straight every day? So I think this is actually also a misconception. So for example, in the research retreat, I see how much my colleagues work <laughs> and actually part of me is really impressed because I was an absolute workaholic until a couple of years ago where I lost interest in this. And now also with the added responsibilities that I actually cannot, I cannot work on the weekends. I cannot work more than eight hours a day maximum. It's just not possible. But even before I had like a, a child in my life, I actually reduced my work hours to a bare minimum. And I do believe that I'm actually less busy than most other people, even you probably. Like I have very limited meetings because I work remotely. I keep it that way. Mm. I also get given the freedom to organize um, things like that. I work super efficiently because I have done what I do for a long time. If I was going into a different field, I would have to invest mm. a lot more. Um, 
So I think there's a misconception. Um, <laughs> I think I actually work pretty little. Um, and then there's another part that I also realized is that a lot of colleagues who are in a similar situation, they have to do a lot of extra work for the community. So for example, reviewing, like I do not review a lot of papers. I do not help with a lot of conference organization. I did that in my past life. I've paid a lot of my dues and I think mm. also like helping to develop Penny Lane. I hope that helps a bit the community. So mm. I don't want to be the lazy one, but this is just a time in my life where I've decided I have to cut out a lot of things and it works surprisingly well mm. if one really like uh, gives up a couple of other things, I guess. Also kind of just sounds like you, uh, yeah, no, you, like you paid your dues. I think that that's pretty, pretty accurate. Yeah. Like I, I, I feel the same a little bit. I mean, obviously I, um, what do I mean by that? Like uh, I we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but, uh, you know, with, I guess I was a similar workaholic, like in school, like I just burnt myself on studying and stuff like that. And, and when I finally got out of school, like, and I got to work, there was a period of like, you know, I feel like I've just, you know, needed when I, this is pretty much when I started at Xanadu, it was just like such a huge relief to not have to have like 10, 12 hour days. And yeah, like when you, when you get to a spot in your life where, you know, there was a huge hill to climb to get to that point, you know, yeah, it's it's okay to say that you paid your dues and you can kind of, you know. It's, it's hard though. I think so many people come to this point around the postdoc time, right? But mm. then obviously once they, for example, in academia, they get high, it's actually very hard to maintain because as a professor, you have to have so many roles and you have to be excellent in all of them and so mm. much depends on you. So I don't even know if you could do this in these roles, <laughs> right? But, but I also think that it takes quite a lot of courage to, so either courage or desperation in my in my situation it just didn't go on i thought either i leave the entire field to something completely different or i cut it down and so that was a bit of an easy decision but it's very scary because you you think you're missing out you think you're not uh, keeping up with everyone else who works so much so and then also you need an environment i think for example we too are lucky because like xanadu people just don't reply to you on the weekend so it's pretty clearly understood that outside of work hours you have your own life um I do believe that also is not always the case. Yeah, a lot. Of, I mean, it's classic toxic workplace culture, and not not here, but definitely come end of work day, like yeah, people here shut their laptops and enjoy their life. That's a big but, pro of working but, here, anyway. Yeah, but I tell you something. So if I say now I work, you know, in really horrible weeks, I sometimes also do a bit of overtime. So let's say eight hours a day, pretty clearly, and I work only four days a week, for example, for Xanadu. But I don't think I get done much less. So I have, as I said, a bit less impact on maybe other people that I help other people, so in supervision or so on and so forth. But in terms of actually the stuff of, work, of the work that I get done, it feels almost more fruitful. And it speaks towards this whole debate mm. on a four day week and work less, but be more uh, productive that everyone's having. So I can actually speak towards that, that it doesn't feel that much less gets done, but yeah. you have to like overcome your initial fear of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, speaking of like turning off your laptop on the weekend and stuff, um, and outside of you know being being a mother, like what do you do in your spare time? Like what 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 are your hobbies right now? Other than yeah, being a mom, or maybe that is just time consuming. I don't know. No, no. So I've got a big hobby that started in my maternity leave, uh, which is gardening. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds gardening sounds a bit lame. So I'm not like sitting there and cutting rose bushes, but in South Africa <laughs> the nature is pretty wild, and in Durban it's even wilder. So think, think of banana leaves or I don't know the other day a leaf came down from a banana tree that that actually like broke our entire roof <laughs> so it's like we're talking about very big structures and then also you know I get maybe people to chop down trees and then build things out of the trunks it's, it's pretty like a, a rough uh, hobby and it's kind of filling a niche that um, ugh, I don't want to oversell it either but it's it's the building one the more uh, creating something planning, you know, to think about soil and compost and how to create a different environment and slowly shaping it. So the place I'm talking about now looks like a complete barren land. Any of our neighbors or anyone who comes visit is always like, oh my gosh, but I know I planted <laughs> the trees. I know exactly how it will look like in 10 years time. I don't right. know if I will see it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So that is super cool. Unfortunately, no one my age can nerd out with me on that one because everyone always gives me the look you're giving me right now, which is this like, Okay, my mom does this. No, no, not <laughs> at all. Actually, no. Um, uh, my fiance, she uh, like we do. 
we did a garden last year, didn't have time for it this year, but we have lots of like house plants. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of counts as gardening, like a little bit. So I can't do that part, the dye, that was always like the experience that was, it's a very um, subtle work dyes in my hands. I think yeah. I'm more there for the rougher things that survive by themselves. Yeah, and uh, and uh, my uh, future in-laws, um, they have a like a kind of, they have a bigger property and they have a greenhouse and they grow their own tomatoes and stuff like that. So no, I don't think that, yeah, no, like my, this is, this is relevant for me for sure. Um, and actually I was, I was watching a, um, a series on Netflix um, about centenarians, people that live over a hundred mm -hmm. and um, the concentration, there's, there's areas of concentration of centenarians called mm -hmm. blue zones and kind of a common theme amongst all these blue zones, no matter where they are, like in Indonesia or, you know, Japan or something like that is um, pretty much everybody who has lived over 100 has a garden. So <laughs> I wonder. Hey, yeah. So maybe uh, you've got that box ticked okay. off. Anyway. I wonder if a tree trunk uh, kills me prematurely. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you might be a, yeah, yeah, no. I'm, uh, I'm, I don't know if you can send me a picture of this banana tree that like has caved in your roof. Yeah. I'd love like I'll I had a, I had a small banana tree as a kid um, in in this I, I lived part part of my childhood in the states in the south where you know banana, a banana tree could potentially live. Um, you know it it got maybe like six feet tall, but so one that towers over your house. Yeah, that one wasn't a banana tree. The banana trees are around. That one is a palm tree and. That's the oh, point okay. of me gardening. I have no clue about any words. So the only thing I can say is this one with the smooth trunk and the big leaves and stuff like that. So I can't even tell you what it is. Oh, okay. okay. There's a long discussion whether one should get rid of it or not, but I'm like fighting for it. <laughs> I find it somehow cool to have these leaves. I can't even move. Yeah, yeah. No, it is cool. Yeah, like this is you now, but you know, what what were you like as a kid? Like, uh, oh, what what did uh, what 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 made you think eventually that like getting into physics was a good idea and yeah um i think that's hard to answer actually but the what what i thought about physics in school so i was someone in school who i guess like many who become scientists i loved everything mm. i love to learn about literally every, except from french i absolutely hated french classes but everything else was cool and i think physics is a bit also for minds like that who are keen on knowledge it's always the ultimate boundary you know like it's seen to be something like clever but also it really like gives you the the limits of what we know about the universe that's how i thought back then and i always thought quantum physics and modern physics will be those things uh, i read books about it i went to lectures where i obviously didn't understand the first thing i didn't even understand why the lecturers were actually so interested in these potential walls and whatever and i don't know mm. what they were talking about i was still like oh this is magic why don't you talk about magic or something anyways and then um yeah, but I never wanted to study physics. In, in Germany, it has uh, a lot of stigmas attached to be antisocial and to be in a certain world. And so it took me a while to get into this field. And then I also never wanted to become a scientist. That was always supposed to be a temporary affair. Hmm. Uh, so I, I do like Google everybody and try and snoop around as much as I can on, on, on people. You had a brief stint in political science? Yes, yeah, so I've got a that's what i thought i would become i see also that was random to be honest there were only a couple of subjects in the university i wanted to go i wanted to go to berlin that was set and then in a certain time and there was only like those courses offered so there was um theology political science or physics physics was the one that i really had a history with mm -hmm. then i decided against physics last minute and checked political science because theology wasn't really suiting me and mm -hmm. um and that was super interesting so i studied up to a diploma which is a master's degree and then I had like a time where I couldn't find a job in political science in the place where I was under the constraints I had. Probably also my CV was weird. Why should someone study physics at the same time? <laughs> Just sure. kind of I always thought it was cool, but it didn't create a good story, I think. Um, so I've got uh, actually two not so good papers from this master's thesis in political science. And then over the last years, I've been in a collaboration with uh, social psychologists, uh, where I'm the machine learning deaf person, and we kind of explore new things you can do with language models and um, okay. questions of opinion and polarization. So there's a couple of papers now popping up from this life as well. That's super interesting. Mm. Cool. So you, but you never had, you never thought you were going to be like a lawyer. Or like a oh my gosh no I, I thought i would uh, oh, i always thought i would work for the no not thought my biggest dream was to work for the united nations or in a big ngo oh, cool. save the world type of thing and 
we are now have a very, very, very different opinion about what it needs to save the world, <laughs> slash who could do it. And um, well, arguably, you're in a pretty good field for for addressing that. Like, given you know, like ChatGPT and how big the AI revolution is going to be, like it's going to change the world. Yeah, maybe you chose the right thing for that. At the end of the day. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. What are you? I don't, I don't make any of this. So I wonder. But so one thing that I'm super passionate about is uh, this machine learning revolution in South in Africa and in South Africa. So that's kind of my personal involvement. We'll go into that. Where there's like uh, something called deep learning in Daba, which is a grassroots movement where people just define. So they say like, okay, machine learning is there. We want to learn it. We want to be creators. We want to be people who generate data sets. We want to contribute in our way to it and. Mm. That's just something, but again, like I'm not the one who's changing the world there. Like those people are changing the world, and I'm just like sometimes organizing a conference. Or <laughs> to be honest, I'm doing the tax for the South African version of that big organization. So I, see. I don't know if this changes the world, but it's actually a pretty <laughs> job that someone has to do. So. Yeah. What, what is your opinion on like ChatGPT and stuff like that coming up? You know. I, I like so. I recently started really appreciating the models behind it, the transformer models, also like why they were designed the way they were designed. And so I think they can unlock a lot in physics that we haven't even thought about because someone has to, first of all, we need the data, then we need to train like one of these big foundational models. Someone needs the money <laughs> and the time. I'm sure these startups are already built or maybe the big companies are looking into this. And I think a lot of the problems we're thinking about now in quantum computing and many body physics will actually be solved by this approach quite easily because Quantum systems are correlated systems. A lot of the correlations you can just learn. There's a very small amount that's so weird in quantum nature that you can't. And this is obviously the place where we're interested in. Um, so I have a lot of respect. I find it quite, quite interesting. However, in terms of machine learning, I like very much the theoretical side of machine learning, which sometimes falls a bit short in these types of big models that are much more an engineering mm. angle. So yeah. I've never used ChatGPT stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm starting to try and use it at home for, for stuff, and it's um, it's kind of incredible, honestly. I'm yeah. My excuse is the following. My excuse is I don't think in my work I ever have a moment or an action where I have to produce something that's generic. Because if I write yeah. a document or proposal, I actually really want to order my thoughts, which I can't do with ChatGPT. If I want to research something, I really want to understand the nuances of something, and it's. Since I don't go in many new fields, maybe this is my own fault, but uh, I don't often have to summarize uh, knowledge from other fields. So if I would need that, maybe I would. That, that's a good point. How I, that's pretty much how I use it is just like if there's something that I have absolutely no idea, like it gives me like a good place to start or, you know, if I just have some random question about something that's hard to Google, like it's a, it's a great resource for that. But you're right. Like, um, like if you wanted to ask ChatGPT to like write a guitar solo for mm -hmm. you, um, it could do one, but like if you're just interested in like just churning out a guitar solo, cool. But if you're actually a guitar player, it won't kind of do something that interesting. I think it's kind of the, the analogy. Yeah. It is an excuse that I also get old and certain technologies are just, I'm not interested. I'm not on social media. <laughs> I mean, for example, scientists always tweet their papers. I'm just, my decision was very early on. If I have to do my own marketing on social media, then I don't want to do science. So just don't do it. And if that doesn't work out, then. So be it. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think I haven't done a single. I think I've tweeted once or retweeted something. I can't even imagine. Yeah. I had one Facebook post in my entire life or two. <laughs> so um, yeah, Maybe I'm just old. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, on the social media thing, you have a whole social media team here to just do that all oh, for you. It, so like it. when yeah, when you do research, <laughs> we just post it for you. Yeah. <laughs> but then someone always asks you of a colleague, could you please retweet? And I'm always like, okay, hopefully no one notices that I'm yeah. just ignoring you. So. Yeah. I don't know. Were there tough decisions that you had to make kind of in, in your undergrad kind of time? Like when you were figuring out political science or physics like and, and were there life lessons that were really meaningful to, to carry with you going into grad school and that sort of thing? For me, there was a lot like in, in undergrad that I learned about myself and how, you know, how it was, it was more so things that really wouldn't work or be applied to grad school, I guess. So kind of. So now you're, I'm just trying to pass what you mean by undergrad and grad school. Obviously, I need to know the names, but right. they don't apply very much to the degrees. For example, I did a five-year degree in political science. That was just one switch, you know, and it was your yeah. first. It would be bachelor's and master's, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, obviously. So maybe the biggest lesson was after my master's in physics, I thought I was pretty educated and smart. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. and then in the That's PhD, good. into the PhD, you know, you learn this humbleness where you start getting more confidence because you start realizing what you don't know and what you don't have to know. And you also start realizing a lot of things that humans know are just a matter of time that you have to invest to start learning them. So the world becomes a lot more accessible in this case. Um, yeah, but then finishing my PhD, the, so finishing my master's, the biggest lesson was, oh, I know so much. And finishing my PhD, the biggest lesson was basically uh, to, to appreciate complexity, which is annoying. For example, if you go to the doctor and you're a scientist mm -hmm. and your doctor tells you it's that and I give you that, I always like totally freak out. I can't even deal with this because of the idea of, of, of having tasted how much nature in real life, and especially the body or physiology or biology or whatever, how complicated these systems are. And anyone giving you about a system or a question, an answer that's um, simplistic without telling you where the caveats lie or that it is a generalization, you start being really suspicious. And many people don't um, appreciate that type of thinking. I guess right around when you were getting into your, maybe when you were just finishing your master's or like, uh, cresting into your PhD. I mean, your PhD was in quantum machine learning. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people in the numerical physics community, mostly people in like condensed matter, I would say, um, when machine learning kind of hit, and there was that really big, huge paradigm shift to like stop doing quantum Monte Carlo, and start putting points into into machine learning. Um, did you see a lot of that coming like and and did you feel a little bit shocked i guess that traditional physics physics numerical physics was like really kind of veering quite sharply towards that direction and and what did you do to adjust there so i think this happened when i was already in the field in mm. the sense that so but you're talking about two different perspectives and i entered in the different one right the um what you're talking about is physics being exposed to machine learning as a data analysis tool that is super powerful and by the way, also like I uh, saw so recently like work by Roger Melko where he said like combined the machine learning approach with the old fashioned like Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and bang, something even better happens. So it's kind of. He was my supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Might be like, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That explains so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, how was like, yeah, my, my yeah. whole master's thesis was quantum Monte Carlo and ah, a little bit of machine learning. So it might even be your paper that I'm talking about that he said, OK, we talk about this offline. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that when I heard about this. Anyways, so my uh, way to venture into it was like in 2013, I guess. And it came off from machine learning has not only the engineering and data analysis side, but also the research side, you know, where you ask what is generalization from data, what can we actually learn, and so on and so forth. And so that was the path how I went in. Actually, even more, I went in from quantum biology. So it's a field where, you know, people might laugh about it, but it's question. So my first question was, can I use um, a certain method called a, uh, a quantum walk based on open quantum systems, so an open quantum systems walk to model dynamics in the brain. That was my master's question. And the answer is like, uh, they don't really fit together and I don't know actually how to do this, but um, then went more from the computational angle. But you can see that it was really not uh, me using machine learning as a powerful tool, but more as a paradigm of, of modeling something. <laughs> This segment we're calling is, uh, it, it's called random sampling. So it's just a bunch of random questions, totally not physics related, although a little bit maybe. Um, what was your first computer? Oh gosh, that was a family computer. I wouldn't even know the model. I know that we always played my young on it. So it must have been okay. Windows 95. Is okay. this even a thing? You speak several languages. Um, what's your favorite one to speak? Like, oh my gosh, the one I wish I could speak. Or <laughs> well, what's the one that you speak where you're like, yeah, I can speak Norwegian? Oh, uh, okay. I can't speak. I love listening to Norwegian. Kvanteberegning. And I would love to speak it again. I think it's close enough that I could learn it quickly again. I, I spoke it more or less before. 
I would really love to speak Isisulu. I think it's the coolest language on the planet. It's so interesting to learn. Um, what language is that native to? So it's like a local language spoken in okay. the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where okay. I live, and uh, it's super cool because the grammar is so clear compared to European languages. It's very logical, very poetic. There's a lot there to it. Uh, anyways, um, but I actually enjoy speaking English the most because then I don't have to. I can't switch very easily, it's even from my mother tongue, which is German to English. I find it very hard to switch. Oh, from. interesting. Okay. Yeah. There's a question in North America about how different fast food is outside, you know, outside of North America, um, particularly McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So I know that probably one of the nicer uh, McDonald's or one of the nicer countries where you can get McDonald's is, uh, is France. And I think that pretty much because the French are so particular about how- you Can't sell them yeah, crap food. Yeah. yeah. So McDonald's yeah. had to be like, we gotta, we gotta step up our game here if we want to have franchises here. So I would like to buy a hamburger. 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 What is McDonald's like in South Africa and in Germany and like, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I'd, and how does it compare to here? In South Africa, it hardly exists. Really? People eat so much chicken that you only have KFC. That's the big deal. Okay. Everyone eats KFC, yeah. So I know of one McDonald's in the whole town. Two, actually. One is close to my house, but it's like new. So I'm fried chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So fried chicken is, is yeah, yeah. okay. It's insane how much chicken gets eaten. Yeah. yeah, so my one half of my family is, is from like the southern states mm -hmm. and fried chicken's big down there too. So okay. maybe I'll have to. I've never eaten at KFC in my life before. I think I've once bitten into one of the wings or whatever that everyone raves about. Drumsticks. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't like K when it comes to fried chicken, KFC is not a good example yeah. for me. There's okay. a franchise in the southern states called Cane's okay. and uh, it's it's unreal. It's good fried chicken, yeah. but okay. Interesting. Good stuff. What is one of the biggest gaffes or, or mistakes you've made during a talk or presentation? Oh my gosh. I related this before. <laughs> <laughs> That was, um, I related this before, maybe even at a QHack session, but many years ago, I was invited to give a keynote talk at a local conference mm. and it was scheduled for, let's say Friday and it was Thursday, two o'clock. And for some reason I checked my emails and I saw an email like, we're all online waiting for you. <laughs> Here's the Zoom link. <laughs> and I clicked the Zoom link and went into a Zoom meeting that was very clearly a keynote or some kind of presentation. And then someone introduced me and said, we're now hear from <laughs> Dr. Maria Schult about this and this topic. You you want, you, you could do so. And in this moment, I had no clue who these people were. If this was my talk from the day after, I haven't prepared it, obviously. And whatever, I had no clue what was happening. And so I quickly pretend I also didn't know what to do. I quickly pretended I had technical difficulties when tried to send emails to the organizers, what's going on here? And I literally just put up slides. There was a random slide deck. There was a time where I still was giving a lot of talks, but it was a random slide deck where I very quickly just changed the date and the, the conference, gave the entire one hour talk, got a couple of not so good questions, but I think it overwhelmed the audience anyways. I mean, it was actually quite a different audience. And um, yeah, and then afterwards I got feedback from the organizers that were super happy with the talk. And then I asked them what happened. Yes. And it turned out it was actually not my talk. They just forgot to ask me to, to give a student version of my talk the day before. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise I've never gotten an email. I'm very careful. Yeah you know, to not uh, miss these opportunities. But I was so proud. And actually, after I signed off there, it was just like one minute later, I had to give another t keynote that was planned. So as I said, I was, there was a time where I had a lot of talks. And after that, I was just, I was drenched by sweat. And I was just like, but I felt pretty, pretty proud of myself. I thought if that happens, Oh, if that happened to me, my stomach would just sink right down know, to the floor. Like, it did. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so the one advantage that I have is that um, I discovered dancing late in my uh, life, especially ballet dancing. And I joined a ballet school where there are the little kids and all their tutus. And we had a lot of shows. So me as an adult, like of, I don't know, 20 something years, I've spent a lot of time on stage in really funky clothes trying to dance in the back and not look too <laughs> stupid. And I think this was so more mind wrecking the situations that I lived through there that um, even that pales in comparison to stuff that I have, <laughs> I have had on stage in dance performances. So. Cool. I, I wouldn't even say that's a that that experience you had of like showing up to a talk that uh, you had hadn't prepared for. That wasn't even your mistake then. It wasn't even a gaffe. But like, I think I don't know. Yeah, you know, you're right. Okay, really big mistake. But yeah. no, no, no. I'm not yeah, asking yeah, you to yeah. figure that out. But yeah, no. Just that's an interesting moment. I do. Sure. <laughs> I do try to prepare well it's not probably what you're fishing for because it's not like really an anecdote but yeah so i realized when i don't 
prepare the, the, the hour before. I'm not well prepared. I give really bad talks. And when I prepare very well, I can give like decent talks. And um, so I had a few of those where I started realizing on slide three that I actually lost the story. And then you have to kind of shuffle through. Luckily in science, there are often talks that um, are not making a lot of sense to a lot of people. So you can actually... <laughs> You can actually get by, you know, but I'm not very happy about this, obviously. Yeah, yeah. What's a trait that you have that's objectively good? It's objectively good to have, but can sometimes shoot you in the foot. So for me, I'll give you an example. I'm very agreeable, mm. um, but like totally opposite of contrarian. I don't like to, I mean, obviously, if I, you know, if there's a, if there's a spirited debate, I'll definitely throw my opinion in there, but I'm never out to like, you know, create conflict or anything like that so um yeah that's it. but it does shoot me in the foot sometimes where i'm like you know i probably should you know speak up or say something but like i'm just kind of just like ah just go with the flow here you know i don't need to say anything it'll just kind of throw a wrench in some gears and i don't need to do that yeah sorry i have to steal that it's the same here and yeah it's really it starts being a problem for example if you supervise students and you're super super friendly and the at some stage, I was in the situation where I was still at university, starting to supervise students, and uh, they were obviously not much younger than me either, so I treated them on, not in very strict terms. And then I started realizing at some stage that every student had an excuse why they wouldn't finish their thesis or do something. It was always <laughs> very good excuses, very elaborate ones, ones that you would always... But I started realizing I'm also giving them the loopholes to run out of situations, and I don't think that was good for them. So I think a few people actually didn't finish their degree because of me not being assertive. So that's not nice. <laughs> One of the things that... Uh, or talks, or I guess uh, things you've thrown out into the field recently is is quantum machine learning the right thing for quantum advantage? I don't know. Like, I don't think that that's contrarian per se, but wait, like... Wait, wait. It's actually, uh, is quantum advantage the right thing for quantum machine right, learning? Right, other way around. No, no, both yeah. works, but this one is actually <laughs> the more uh, important one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's funny you say you're you're kind of agreeable because that's not a very... Mm. That, that was a hot... That's a hot take, you know? That's true, but it's more like, I mean, to say something... So first of all, I think if I was really in a community where I would think that people would hate me, I might not even do that. <laughs> so I can only do this because I would like a lot of my colleagues right, and I've right, been right. feeling supported. So it's a very calculated risk to be controversial in this sense. I also do that one because I know that a lot of students need this perspective, I think, mm. so I really believe in it. But it's more in the one-on-ones, you know, like... I, I see, I see. To, cool. I, I don't like conflict, I don't like fighting. <laughs> Okay, I guess on the topic of like talks, a common thing that we have here with, with, with everybody that I've talked to so far is that communication and explaining and teaching is, is key. And um, obviously at Xanadu and, and Penny Lane, we put a big emphasis on this. And I know you, you largely agree with that point, but how do you make sure that everything that you do can be and is explained in a way that people can understand it because it's like really tough. Yeah, so, um, well, I don't obviously. <laughs> so very often I read my own stuff from the past and I wouldn't wouldn't probably have access to it in the way that I hoped back then people would. But so I don't know, we put a super big in emphasis in our group on paper writing. So mm. it's not everyone's favorite tool, but so first of all, you don't, um, there's a lot of techniques that actually work very well. For example, reduce the jargon as much as you can. If there's two or three different flavors of words, only use the one. Um, make your paper be written in a way that at every stage you will ask yourself, what does the reader worry about right now? Don't overestimate your readers. Don't mm. write only for your best colleagues. Understand that most of your papers and content is, is read by early PhD students and then remember how horribly lost you were back then. And so this, I think there's a lot you can do if you just put a lot of emphasis on this and the resources into this. TLDR, like, put your put yourself in other people's shoes. Yeah, yeah and don't yeah. forget how horrible that was. I, yeah, mean, I think, yeah. like, especially, like, to weigh what is important or what is not important, that takes such a long time, mm. right? And, yeah. uh, and so then if you talk about a concept, and especially often, often it's very cheap. Mm. Sometimes you just have to, when you say a word, just have a half sentence that explains it, and that takes you a millisecond. And immediately someone else, for example, in a talk can, can join this. Or you say, you know, um, you know, polynomial time scaling, which is good. And just the which is good makes someone understand your entire argument. If you wouldn't say this is good, someone just who doesn't understand what polynomial time scaling means uh, is completely lost as to what you want to say. So it's often quite cheap, but you have to think about it. That's a really good example. Yeah. Um, I guess on the topic of communication, like um, 
it's it's been a couple of years since we've been out of lockdown, and I know you do work uh, work uh, virtually uh, most of the time. But um, how does it feel to be here and and like see people and like talk to people face to face? Like, do you think it's you know how does that impact your ability to communicate things to people and that sort of thing? Yeah, um, I do believe that the um, the friendships come out of meeting people really in mm. real life so mm. those little connection points of just like updating a friendship with a colleague that you've known for so many years i think this is like super important for mm. that to be honest a lot of communication can be done also virtually i feel especially mm. if people are friendly so um yeah so i think it's less there i always think there's a, a a moment in a scientific project or also in maybe if you write software that is better to share in person and that's frustration i find because in a meeting you just like talk about a problem and then you stop the meeting and then everyone's like there with the emotion when you stop the meeting in real life you would have a coffee together we would mm. laugh about something and that's kind of a part that's missing so that's sometimes really hard yeah so. yeah so yeah like we said you're, you're here for this research retreat um you know putting brains together to try and come up with something really cool and um what's the most exciting thing or what's the thing that you're most excited for in, in this field both from a research perspective and um, from a community perspective so I think my standard answer will be a bit different but I think I've voiced it in so many channels that it's kind of like probably yeah. fine but from this research retreat what, what is the most exciting thing and that came also a bit from your ex-supervisor Roger last week and like a couple of people who actually have voiced this thought in the last two weeks is um, the understanding that what is much more important than, no, not much more important, let me be careful, but <laughs> also really important instead of just creating new algorithms and making them better, is to make data accessible from quantum devices. So for example, let's say if we say like one day our ChatGPT machine learning transformers can actually add a lot of value to our community, but if this happens in a couple of years, we need data to train it. And everyone in their lab is generating a lot of data. Even the theorists often have like little data sets they pass around. There's data published with papers. And it's all very inaccessible. And just mm. like to put a little bit of effort, uh, voluntary effort into making this accessible, creating a culture of, imagine we had billions and billions of data sets about quantum computers. I can't imagine that something game changing wouldn't happen just from that fact. So if if those that are happy to like publish them, often universities or institutions are actually have, have incentives to do so, mm. then um, I think that's the single most impactful thing we could do. And that wasn't entirely clear to me before, I think. Our, our data sets website too, that we recently launched, that probably was like right up your alley, like nice, you know, yeah, pro was, yeah. probably one of your most favorite features probably in the, in the yeah, last. And, and I, um, you know, I saw the discussions before, how should we build it? What should we build it for? And for me, it's an example. Now, I wasn't involved in this at all, but sure. where someone like built something that I now see with this idea, I could use it or we could use it as researchers. It, obviously, there will be other things that are bigger that are different, but it might be one of the tools that fits this purpose. So that's nice if you have software built so that when someone has the idea, it's already there. That's uh, cool. So yeah. Congrats to the team who did that. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think it's a good place to end it. But any last words for people looking to get into quantum open source software, like quantum machine learning, like in general, yeah, any last bits of advice? Quantum open source software, you just have to commit. <laughs> you <laughs> you commit. To, yeah, you just have to contribute. And uh, basically having good contributions to a code base are very valued by teams and uh, can get you a job. So this is actually a very clear route to, I mean, it's, it's difficult, right, to mm. be at that level, but, but it's something that people can do. And for the research, I think uh, this critical thinking, don't trust your, your superiors in what they have cooked up the last 30 years. It, it will likely not be the thing that should be there in 10 years' time. Don't be agreeable. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, I think that's a good place to end it. Thanks, Maria, for joining me. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to have you here. And um, best of luck going forward and safe travels back to, you're going back to South Africa? Tomorrow, yeah. Cool, awesome. Yeah, thanks so yeah. much for joining me. Cheers. Thanks, okay. Cheers, Bye. Oh, no, I just did the nice thing and called my name in front of the <laughs> yeah. camera. <now. laughs> I would never be able to, like, just do something for free.